This week on Brian Ross Investigates, the money duck. Christian broadcaster William Neal Gallagher promised his followers huge financial rewards if they invested with him. Less government, more personal responsibility, and with the help of God, a better world. But prosecutors say this man of God was a crook. We found that there was a very, very large Ponzi scheme uh, that was going on. Almost 200 victims cheated out of some $28 million. Fraudulent transfers were made to his mistress. So this man of God had a mistress. He indeed had at least one. Plus, the man who tried to blow the whistle on Bernie Madoff and his Ponzi scheme. Harry Markopoulos says the schemes continue to this day. They come across them seemingly every month, and they're everywhere, in every community. His advice on how to spot them. Anytime you see the word guarantee, run, don't walk away from the investment, it's a scam. And this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. See if you agree with what they had to say about this White House correspondent. But he was utterly delusional. Um, in, especially in talking about the events of January 7th. From the Law and Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined as always by my colleague here at Law and Crime, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with the story of a massive fraud scheme that targeted followers of a popular Christian radio broadcaster, who it turns out was running a massive Ponzi scheme, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. It was more than 100 years ago that an Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi became infamous, his name forever linked to financial crime, after bilking his investors of some $20 million, which would be close to a quarter billion in today's dollars, Brian. And Rhonda, since then, Ponzi schemes have again and again been used to cheat unsuspecting investors, including most recently by Bernie Madoff, and now this new case that unfolded in Texas. Dr. Neil Gallagher is a premier true American with integrity in all his pursuits. His key goal is to help others take responsibility for their financial future. His life's passion is to help people retire safe, early, and happy. He called himself the Money Duck, and his broadcasts on Christian radio and television outlets gave him a very receptive audience. Freedom requires education and empowerment, and I educate and empower clients. Less government, more personal responsibility, and with the help of God, a better world. But behind the man of God, authorities say, was a duplicitous con man running a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme. And we're joined now by Lori Varnell, who's the chief of the Elder Fraud Unit in the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office there in Dallas. Ms. Farnell, thank you for being with us. How did you get on to this money doc, Doc Gallagher? Well, originally the case began by a, a, a couple that walked into the police department to complain that uh, he had taken their money. And we opened an investigation in Tarrant County and started investigating uh, the complaints against him. And that's when we found that there was a very, very large Ponzi scheme uh, that was going on. And help our viewers understand, what is a Ponzi scheme? So a Ponzi scheme is a scheme in which you are tricked into investing into uh, basically somebody's checking account most of the time. And what happens is they have pre previous investors who are trying to get their investments, have a return. Uh, it's usually, a, 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 it's always up and to the right. So there's no risk whatsoever, and it's always a guaranteed return. Those are hallmarks of, a, of the sale of a Ponzi scheme. So because that's an unreasonable expectation, they now have to make it pay off for their earlier investors so they can keep the scheme going. So they get newer investors and pay their older investors with new investors' money. All the while, they are skimming off the top. This is Doc Gallagher. Do you know the number one question to ask a financial planner? How long you've been in business? Good question. And how long had Gallagher been doing this and how big did it get to be? So our case, uh, the indictment started in 2013, but the investors complaints went all the way back to 2009. And how big it got? Well, he had almost 200 customers and he, um, the, according to their claims, 
uh, had taken them for $38 million. And the victims were mostly the elderly? Yes, sir. And these were um, their life savings. He took their life savings. Gallagher's promotional videos were shameless. He has authored over 70 professional and popular articles with four current books under his belt, The Money Doctor's Guide, Hunter, The Four Secrets of Protecting Your Safe Money, Burning Passionate Prayers for Men on Fire, and Jesus Christ Money Master, in which all of his books offer a powerful array of financial understanding and influence. So he was um, on Christian broadcasting networks. And during his time online on those broadcasting stations, he would tell them, see you at church on Sunday. And he would walk in and pray over people and put his hands on people. And they would tell me, they told me about how he would act like this was God's will for them. And um, because we live in a community that has a very large Christian base, uh, he had a very wide listening audience and was able to amass a great fortune because of it. And they trusted him because they thought he was a man of God? Yes, sir. That's exactly why. And so um, once he walked in the door as a prayer and a Christian, uh, they didn't ask as many questions as they might have of somebody else. Now, with over 30 years of his visionary style, Dr. Gallagher has guided over a thousand individuals in the development of their financial future with his company, the Gallagher Financial Group. But earlier this year, Gallagher pleaded guilty to charges he had bilked almost 200 of his loyal Christian broadcast listeners, showing no signs of remorse in the courtroom, according to the prosecutor. No, none. None whatsoever. He um, sat in the courtroom with his arms crossed and his brow furrowed and would roll his eyes occasionally and um, really was disrespectful, I think, to the victims. And what was his defense? His defense was that he had taken the money and put it into charity and he was playing Robin Hood. And that was a huge lie. He was basically running a Ponzi scheme. It was an investment in his checking account. And what was he doing with the money? So, um, you know, there were a lot of things that he was doing. He was paying Ponzi payments to keep his scheme going. Fraudulent transfers were made to his mistress, Debbie Carter, in the amount of $1.6 million. So this man of God had a mistress. He indeed had at least one. Not exactly the message the money doc was preaching to his followers. The good Lord has made us to give unconditional love and to accept unconditional love. You've got to be sure you totally trust that financial planner you're working with. If I didn't have any money with you, would you still care about me? That's the number one question. God bless you. What was the sentence? Three life sentences and three 10-year sentences. So he won't be coming out anytime soon? No, sir. We certainly... Don't expect him to be able to live out that for very long because he's 81 years old. So we don't expect him to get out. All right. Laurie Varnell, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Very good advice. Thank you. The Money Doc's alleged mistress has been charged in connection with the Ponzi scheme. She has pleaded not guilty and is scheduled to go on trial sometime next year. Coming up next, we'll hear from the certified fraud examiner who tried to blow the whistle on Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme with advice on what to watch out for. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmad Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. The three men charged will now stand trial. For live gavel gavel coverage of the trial, subscribe to Law & Crime on YouTube TV today. The fact is, no one knows more about Ponzi schemes than the man who's about to join us, Harry Markopoulos, a certified fraud examiner. Mr. Markopoulos was the first person to spot what was going on with Bernie Madoff's operation, even though he sent his warnings to the Security Exchange Commission and they essentially blew him off. Harry later testified about that before Congress. As today's testimony will reveal, my team and I tried our best 
to get the SEC to investigate and shut down the Madoff Ponzi scheme with repeated incredible warnings to the SEC that started in May 2000 when the Madoff Ponzi scheme was only a three to seven billion dollar fraud. We knew then that we had provided enough red flags and mathematical proofs to the SEC for them where they should have been able to shut him down right then and there at under seven billion dollars. But by the time Bertie Madoff's Ponzi scheme collapsed, he had cheated his customers out of more than $64 billion. His massive crime became the subject of numerous books and two movies, including one on ABC featuring Richard Dreyfus, based on the book that I wrote about Madoff. You want to know how to get people to trust you with their money? You present it as an exclusive thing. Right now it's a closed fund. After that, you couldn't stop them from giving you their money if you tried. I'm accusing him of running a Ponzi scheme. We got a problem, Bernie. Madoff died in prison earlier this year at the age of 82. So, Mr. Marco Polis, thank you for being with us here this evening. Tell me why these fraud schemes, these Ponzi schemes, continue to happen. It's a combination of factors. It's mainly greed. You want to believe, so there's hope. You hope that those returns are real. You see other people seemingly getting rich overnight and get rich quick schemes, and they want a piece of the action. And so they fall victim to some very simple schemes, and they spend not one second actually asking questions. Can this be real? How can I verify if this is being real, if this is real? And so they do zero due diligence, and as a result, they get trapped. And do they rely too much on the government? Is the government doing enough of a job to detect these Ponzi schemes before they accumulate so many victims? Investors can't hope, can't hope that the government's going to catch these schemes before they get off the ground. A lot of these schemes, in fact, all of them start small and then they get big. Once a scheme gets big enough and over a certain size, it will fall onto the government's radar screen because enough people will become ensnared and trapped into the scheme Eventually, someone's not going to get paid. The fraudsters are going to make promises and they're going to fail to deliver. And once they do that, these angry investors are going to say, oh, I'm going to call the government. And they pick up the phone and they call either the FBI or the Department of Justice. Sometimes they call the SEC. And eventually the government gets onto the scheme and starts investigating. And of course, by then it's too late. After the Madoff scandal was revealed and you testified, the SEC said, we're really going to increase our enforcement of Ponzi schemes. Have they? Yes. The SEC had 65 recommendations from the Inspector General's office for how to do a Ponzi scheme and do it more effectively. They adopted all 65 measures recommended, and they're very good at Ponzi schemes, but they have to first find out about them. And unfortunately, they have to get big enough for someone to make a call and drop a dime and call the government and tell them about it because they're not going to proactively have enough people to investigate every investment offered to investors. There's only 5,000 people at the SEC. They're too small to do that. Uh, are there currently schemes that you're looking at which you think are in fact Ponzi schemes? Yes, I haven't done a Ponzi scheme case in about three years. I basically refer them out right now because I'm busy on public company accounting fraud cases, but I come across them seemingly every month and they're everywhere in every community. What do you see that the uh, that tells you this is a Ponzi scheme. Help our viewers understand what to look for. Returns that are guaranteed. Anytime you see the word guarantee, run, don't walk away from the investment, it's a scam. Anything to do with an affinity program such as religion. Religion and money do not mix. I think that's in the Bible. People should know better and they seemingly fall for the religious scams every time. Sometimes the schemes have you do something so you think that you're working for it. In China, there were over a million victims that thought they could make money by buying ant farms and farming ants to make medicine. And that, that took in a lot of money before the culprits went to jail. In the United States, we saw something equally ridiculous, pigeon farming. People were raising pigeons for the restaurant trade, which you can laugh at it, but a lot of victims in Canada and in the United States lost a lot of money thinking they could make money selling pigeons to restaurants. You mentioned uh, relig religion and affinity groups like that. This case in Texas involved uh, fundamental Christians. What should people think about when there's an appeal to their religion that this is somebody I can trust, a pastor? I have done religious affiliated Ponzi schemes and they go back decades. Uh, a very interesting one was New Era Philanthropy in Philadelphia. 
ran for six years from 1989 to 1995. And the culprit, John Bennett, was promising to double your money. If you would give him $5,000 or more, in three months, he would double that and you could make a charitable donation on your behalf to a charity of your choosing. And he instead all sorts of endowments, big time endowments and philanthropies. And eventually he was running low on money. So he increased the minimums to $25,000 and he increased the length of time before he would double your money. Well, finally, it got big enough, and it was a whistleblower who was an accounting professor at Spring Arbor University in Michigan by the name of Albert Miller. And what he did, he went to the university president, and the university president said, he just gave us a check. He, we doubled our money, and he showed it to him. He put it right in front of his face. You were wrong. This guy, this John Bennett, he's money. Well, the scheme collapsed and the university president ended up apologizing to the accounting professor, but it was too late for the university. They lost the, uh, overall, it was over a half a billion dollar scam. Has anyone ever apologized to you for ignoring your warning signs about Bernie Madoff? Yes, I've had several people at the Securities and Exchange Commission tell me that they wish they had investigated more diligently and they, they were embarrassed by their agency's performance and they vowed to do better. And of course they have, they've done a lot better. And do you think now, finally, there are people out there who could one day be as big of a scammer as a Bernie Madoff was? Oh, most definitely. Bernie Madoff's record of $64.8 billion is going to be broken. I hope it's not going to be broken in the United States, but I do have a feeling it can be broken and will be broken probably in Asia, probably in China, probably in Russia or somewhere in Eastern Europe, someplace where their investors are less sophisticated than the United States. Gary Markopoulos, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brian. Coming up next, this week's winners and losers in the media, both of them White House correspondents. See if you agree. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who is the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams media empire. And Aidan, this week, the winner and the loser, both White House correspondents. Let's start with the winner, John Carl from ABC News, whose new book, Betrayal, The Last Act of the Trump Show, comes out November 16th. He talked about it on The Stephen Colbert Show. But he was utterly delusional, um, in, especially in talking about the events of January 6th. We, we have a clip here. So some people were saying 1776, if it's rigged, if it's being stolen, why not charge well, I, the Capitol? I, don't know. I, did, I hadn't heard that, but people were very angry. And people were there, that crowd, never, the press, the fake news, which is fake, uh, the fake news never talked about the size of that crowd. That crowd was a massive crowd. It was a massive crowd. I mean, so he's uh, he's missing the narrative here. He yeah, can you imagine? I'm asking it's about him whether he's popular. Yeah, I'm asking him about a riot. I'm asking him about the, the, one of the darkest days in American history, and he's talking about how many people came out to see him. And Aiden, Mr. Trump has called a John Carl a third-rate reporter. I think that would be a badge of honor for John, a former colleague of mine. That's right. And uh, Trump also spoke out about this book, which is uh, you know you, you know you've made it in the uh, in the pantheon of Trump tell-alls when uh, Trump himself is trashing you in a statement. Um, but, you know, I think it's hard to get excited these days about these Trump exposés, um, particularly ones that focus on the last months of the Trump administration. But this one is just packed with so much shocking information about what went on during that insane time. And we've seen a few of bits of reporting come out in exclusive excerpts that have been published um, by various magazines and, uh, and websites. Uh, we know that John Kelly, uh, who was Trump's chief of staff for a while, wanted the 25th Amendment invoked uh, during the Capitol riot. Uh, and that he wanted Trump effectively deemed unfit for office and removed. Uh, we also know that there are photos of Mike Pence hiding in a room during the riot when a bunch of Trump supporters were storming the Capitol and calling for Mike Pence to be hanged. Um, those photos were not allowed to be published by John Carl. Mike Pence's team stopped that from happening. Um, but there's just a lot of really great reporting here from Jonathan Carl, uh, who is an outstanding chronicler of the Trump administration um, when he was serving uh, as uh, ABC News uh, chief White House correspondent. Uh, under that administration. As you say, we think we've heard all about Donald Trump, but every new book comes out with new details that just, uh, you know, grab your attention like you can't believe what's going on. 
Let's talk exactly. about this week's loser, the other White House correspondent who you have dealt with, who's a loser. Tell us about her. Right. So Emerald Robinson, she is the White House correspondent for Newsmax. Um, she had been suspended from Twitter last week um, because she posted a sort of insane uh, conspiracy theory about vaccines that basically alleged um, that they had some sort of tie to Satan. Um, she was suspended from Twitter. She received a rebuke from Newsmax uh, in the form of a statement. Um, she got back on Twitter on Tuesday morning and started continuing to push the conspiracy theory that um, there's some sort of satanic tie to these vaccines. Within hours, she was permanently banned from Twitter, um, so she's no longer on the platform anymore. And Newsmax actually issued another statement, uh, this time to the Daily Beast, saying that she is going to be off the air at Newsmax while the outlet reviews her social media posts. Um, so not only was she banned from Twitter this week uh, forever, uh, her job is also in danger. But also of interest is Newsmax has its own vaccine mandate now. That's true. So at uh, Mediaite, we exclusively reported on Friday uh, that Newsmax has started to implement a vaccine mandate. Um, they're basically going along with uh, the Biden administration's policy, uh, where businesses with more than 100 employees either have to uh, ch check vaccines or give testing once a week. Um, so that has created a, a lot of consternation at Newsmax because the network and its hosts have railed against these vaccine mandates. Um, there's a bit of outcry within the network. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Very interesting to see that uh, essentially a hypocrisy on the part of the, uh, the company, both at Newsmax and in some ways at Fox, where they have their hosts uh, criticizing the mandates, but then instituting it themselves for their own employees. That's true. And there's always these little word play that's being going on where uh, Newsmax hosts have since said there is no vaccine mandate at Newsmax because we're not forcing everyone to get the vaccine because there is the out uh, uh, for weekly testing. But of course, when Biden unveiled the plan uh, that mandated the vaccines or weekly testing, everyone at Newsmax and Fox News decried it as a mandate. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very hypocritical, yes. Indeed. Aidan McLaughlin, thank you so much, Editor-in-Chief of Mediate. And that's our program for tonight. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to our great crew here at Law & Crime for getting us on the air and off the air every week.